Today on The Grid, we're talking to Getty sports photographer Julio Aguilar as we talk about uh, shooting on assignment uh, for agencies, wire services as a stringer. Uh, we're also talking about credentialing, preparing for a shoot, the ins and outs of what it takes to, to shoot in the fast-paced world of photojournalism. And it starts in just 60 seconds. Grid is brought to you by Tamron. Check out their 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8 lens. It's for Sony full frame mirrorless. It's awesome. Go to tamron-usa.com. And Profoto, the light shaping company. Check out the Profoto B1X, powered all the right places. Go to profoto.com slash US. And Platypod, the tripod alternative that is changing the world. Everybody has a Platypod. You should too. Go to platypod.com. <laughs> Well, hey, Grid Nation. How you, how's it going? We're here with, uh, as you can see, Scott's still out, right? I, I, so we're taking over the show again. So uh, Scott's over in France still. Uh, had a great workshop. Now he's out shooting. And uh, But joining me today is Julio. Hey, Julio. How's it going? What's up? How are you? Yeah, so Julio's joining us. Julio is a, uh, well, you're a sports photographer. You also shoot architecture. And you also shoot portraits, right? Correct. Yeah, so you kind of do a bunch of different things. That's that's the that's the gist of it. Yeah. Well, plus Julio is like a man. You you do everything. You do the you've uh, I've seen you doing assisting, leading, all that on shoots. So all over the place. It's kind of. Uh, and you've probably seen Julio in some of our classes because sometimes <laughs> you assist some of our guys. I do. I assist a lot. That's uh, that's opened my world up from assisting here to. Um, producing and assisting on commercial sets, uh, becoming second photographer, first photographer, and just having mm -hmm. my entire career yeah. kind of open the door from there. Yeah. So really, uh, though, this show talking about specifically your sports photography, um, and then we're specifically talking about about shooting on assignment and, and stuff like that. But So before we get too far into it, maybe clearing up some of the things about when we say things like assignment, wire services, stringer these terms maybe we could just go over like a few things with uh first like what is a wire service a wire service is basically a photo agency so when a newspaper or a blog or an actual news site wants to write uh something about an event that's going on currently they're going to go search the uh these specific wire services or photo agencies to try to find an image that's um, that's kind of going along with what's happening. So if it's a football game, there's a touchdown that happens. ESPN wants to see that picture immediately because there is a little bit of a delay between what you're seeing on the TV mm -hmm. and what's yeah. happening in the game. And so the goal is to have a picture pop up on ESPN within seconds of the catch happening or the kick, you know, the field mm -hmm. goal happening yep. or one of the 13 goals that happened yesterday during the World Cup for uh, <laughs> the U.S. team. So that's just... Yep. It's kind of how that goes with wire so services. So, like, uh, an example would be uh, AP and, like, you shoot for Getty, right? Correct. So, these are, like, examples of wire services. And there's there's a lot. I mean, there's USA Today. Yep, um, yep. There's Gary Shulton. There's, there's tons of these different little agencies that kind of, like, they all feed into the same uh, the same pool of images that these editors and, and writers go to look for images to kind of go along Correct. with their stories. Yeah, because like uh, Scott years ago, he was shooting sports. Uh, he was shooting for Zuma Press, so yeah. that was another uh, wire service. So, um, but yeah, so let me let me clear up something too. Is so you're working for Getty, but you're not a oh, well, what they would call like a staff photographer. No, you're no. you're what do they call you? I, I'm a stringer, so right. um, I'm a stringer and a contributor. I get sent out on assignment for jobs, but I'm not getting a, a salary pay per year. I'm getting paid per assignment, um, or in some instances, I'll actually get paid on the back end where I'll shoot something on spec, uh, which mm -hmm. is on speculation, and then if an image gets picked up to be used for an article afterwards, then I would see uh, a licensing fee come to me after it goes through Getty. Right. And basically, the term stringer is just a, a, a fancy term for freelancer, right? That's exactly what it is. Exactly. So if you hear the word stringer, it's a fancy term for freelancer. Um, and that's what we wanted to talk about. I mean, I, I do a lot of the photojournalism journalism as well. I'm shooting more for not wireless services, but agencies who are hiring me uh, to do a shoot, you know, for certain things where you're, hi you're hired to cover it for a wire service who's then selling it to 
agencies or news agencies and stuff like that, they're picking it up. And then, so like you said, sometimes you're getting a fee, sometimes you're getting the fee on the back end when they actually use your images, right? Correct. Like, um, didn't, like recently, like a couple of uh, big newspapers picked up some of your images, right? Yeah. Like yeah New York had, Times, I think. I yeah. had uh, two different images picked up within a week um, in the New York Times, which is a, a pretty yeah, cool feat. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and it was awesome oh, yeah. to see that. But, yeah, you know, very cool. You know, that's, that's all with the, uh, the sports photography. Sometimes you get picked up, most of the time yeah. you don't. Yeah, that happens. That's the world. Um, so is there a big, like, is there a big difference, like, when you're doing this between a staffer for, for Getty or AP or something and somebody who is a stringer? What is the big differences between those two? That's a good question. Uh, the biggest difference I know of is just um, your, who you have around you. Uh, staffers typically, they're seasoned. They're, they're seasoned to the point where they mm -hmm. know... They know stadium staff. They know security guards. They know uh, other photographers in the area. They know the team photographers. They know the AP photographers. So these these guys and girls that are staffers um, that they're all around the country in all major cities. They they get to do the job that they want to do, and they're not. It's it's not like a you're going to take some pictures and you're going to send them into the wire and you're going to save some other ones for a second edit. Their mind is like get these images out get them going and not worrying about saving something for a second edit to try to make more money, uh, which mm -hmm. is where, you know, as a, a news coverage photographer, like a sports photographer, we, we should thrive more to, to try to get the best images out there because that's the best way the images are going to be seen is as soon as they're there, as soon as you right. get them ready. And if you guys also, uh, you know, if you guys have any questions for Julio about uh, any of that, we'll go over, uh, like I talked about, we're going to go over credentialing a little bit, uh, go over your gear, stuff you shoot with. We'll look at uh, the next segment, some of your images. I know we're getting that hooked up. Um, but before we get on to that, um, one, just wanted to ask, like, is there a difference between uh, a copyright? How's the copyright set up for you being a stringer? Uh as a stringer, you know, I'm required to send in X amount of images at the beginning, my first round of images, and that copyright is owned by Getty. Okay. But I'm getting paid uh, a fee to fee. be there, yep. you know, a, a day rate of sort or an event rate um, for me to send that stuff over. And then the second edit's where, where we talk about uh, mm -hmm. myself retaining my copyright and Getty getting a piece of it once it gets used. Yeah, and, the and then same... they're paying you for the per use of that m when it gets picked up. Exactly. Well, then that's a big thing that I know difference between a staff photographer is a lot of times they every image they're shooting and submitting, that's all copyrighted through the wire service. So technically the wire service is contracting you at a salary rate to own all those images. Yeah. That's... But again, usually you're at that point where you've uh like you said you know the you know the game so well you know the stadium so well you know the people so well that you know it's just a, a second nature thing for you right so um but yeah we got some uh shout outs here we got uh people all over the world again we got uh joseph saying made it two weeks in a row hello from the blueberry capital of the world uh do you know where the blueberry capital of the world is no idea where that uh, is i don't know maybe maine I don't know. That's the only state that I know is like blueberries, um, but it could be somewhere else in the world. Um, Cheeky Nando saying hello uh, all the way from Europe. Uh, Deb saying hello from a sizzling hot California. Hey, Deb. Uh, Perry saying hi from Germany. Wow. So we got Gary G saying hello from Phoenix. We got Josh saying hello from D.C. We got Patrick saying hello from somewhere in Ireland. I can't. Oh, there it is. Tipper. Tipperary, Ireland, and then uh, Alenka's saying hi from New Jersey. So, hey, if you guys got any questions for Julio, uh, anything about, um, oh, there we go. So it's actually oh, it's saying the Jersey. Hamilton is a town in Atlantic City, New Jersey, that is known as the blueberry capital of the world. I would I not have known it was New Jersey as the blueberry capital of the world. But there you go. You learn something new every day. So, um we have to take a break, but when we get back from the break, I want to go um, into Julio's images, uh, the game, how you process, how you, because this is one thing in, the, in that world is uh, speed. You know, you've got to get stuff up right away. So how do we do that? How do you get stuff up? How do you get stuff processed? All that, all that jazz. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. Uh, more on the grid. If you've got any questions, just ask in the comments.
Hi folks, Scott Kelby here. I want to tell you about an email I got, an angry email. So I, you know it's angry because the subject line says, Mr. Kelby. First, anytime somebody calls me Mr. Kelby, you know it's, you're in trouble. Mr. Kelby, I'm so mad at you. That's what the, head, the subject line was. I'm like, oh great. So I go read it and he's like, Mr. Kelby, I, I saw your, your class on photo books and, and I went and made a photo book and I'm just so upset because now I've made 34 photo books and you've got me hooked on these. <laughs> and I went, Whew. but that's how it is with photo books. I mean, think about this. All right, we have the shooting part, which is very creative, right? And then we have the editing part, which can be fun and creative. When you start making photo books, you're adding a third leg to this chair. Now you've got this other thing where you're the photo editor. You decide which photos make the book, how big they are, what goes on the left, what goes on the right. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. And Adobe made some changes. Now you can lay out pages any way you want. You can just, literally, it's like free transform. You can just make the photo whatever size you want. You can have multiple photos. They can overlap one another. You can have grids of nine, 15. You don't have to have a grid at all. You can just design it. I wanted to do a class that takes you from beginning to end, and I'm gonna show you how to make it so fast that you'll be able to focus on just the fun. And when you hand somebody that photo book and they get it in their hands and they're gonna be like, you, you did this, this is your photography? They're gonna be blown away. You're gonna be blown away. You're gonna have a great, great time doing it. And the whole thing is self-contained right here in Lightroom Classic. If you wanna learn a whole bunch about doing photo books and you'll be able to follow along right with me and do your photo book right that same time, go watch my class. It's called Creating Beautiful Photo Books in Lightroom Classic and it's exclusively at Kelby One. When you need a tripod that is compact, that is portable enough to take with you anywhere, one that is adaptable to any situation, that will prove versatile enough for any shoot, and is compatible with your other gear, giving you freedom to create your own perspective. Look no further, Platypod Ultra does it all. Visit platypod.com for more info. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by b &H Photo, the professional source since 1973. Well, hey guys, we're back and we're here with Julio. We're talking about uh, on assignment, you know, being on assignment, uh, covering uh, sports, um, you know, covering anything, it's very similar. I mean, I cover rockets, so it's very similar to sports. Uh, very fast paced, like you said. Like the minute the rocket <laughs> leaves the pad, they're like, "Where's the shot? Where's the shot? Where's the shot?" I think you're faster paced than I yeah. am. Yeah. Well, no, 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 <laughs> no. I don't know. It's about the same. It's actually, you know, it's funny because um, I always say that the most uh, the um, uh, the most I've learned from another genre. Uh, with rocket photography is sports. And actually the one that I've learned the most from was Dave Black. So Dave Black and his sports photography has taught me more about rocket photography than anything else. It's crazy. But anyways. It's, um, it's, it's teaching you patience, that's what it is. Oh yeah. Well, the other thing is uh, the, the whole concept of knowing your subject, which I think we could get into, um, you know, as you get into sports, you know, knowing your subject, knowing uh, the sport that you're shooting, being able to predict motions, being able, I mean, it's a lot about being able to predict what's going on, you know, but really honestly, uh, focusing on shooting for a wire service, you know, um, I know I wanted to walk through your last game and stuff like that. And Cheeky Nando has a question I think would lead into this is how do you upload to the wire service? Are you shooting on a computer and someone else is sending them from the computer? Are you right directly into the camera? I'd love to know the technical side. So maybe you could walk us through a game. You shot it. Okay, what do I do? How do I go through that? Maybe walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really good question. That's something that uh, I used to come up with all the time because I could never understand how these pictures got up so quickly mm -hmm. when you see the photographer yep. and you're like, they didn't move. Um, so on bigger games, bigger events, either a, uh, a championship or a playoff game, 
we have editors. Uh, even most NFL games, we have an editor. Uh, I actually play editor as well on some other games because it's a, it's a fantastic job and it's awesome to be able to look at thousands of other images from your team and you're the one that's selecting the best images that are going out on the wire. So basically what an editor is doing is they're just looking at the feed of everything that's coming in. Um, and how they're getting that is sometimes we have wireless transmitters connected directly to uh, the Canons or the Nikons, uh, sending it via Wi-Fi from their phone back to the computers in the back room. Sometimes we'll be hardwired at basketball games uh, where we go in days in advance. Uh, the Final Four, we went in like six days in advance uh, to run all of the cable up to the rafters and underneath the... Uh, underneath the stadium uh, so you can actually get the, the images almost instantaneously, mm -hmm. um, especially with all the yeah. remotes too. And that's how we're firing these remotes. Um, and other times it's just tagging them in camera and waiting for that right time to run back to your computer, drop your memory card, quickly uh, run through just your basic edits where it might correct color if you need it to. You can crop it into whatever kind of crop you need to. Um, Always caption. You, you cannot send an image without a caption. And then it fires off to the wire. Uh, so that's how we get these images up so quickly. Um, like, I'm going to walk you guys through a baseball game that I shot last weekend. And it, uh, I think all of my images, I did a, a, a second, uh, second or third, um, I did a pregame drop, a second or third inning drop, again in the seventh inning, and then at the end, the postgame. Uh, and that's, mm -hmm. I based that all yep. off of what's happening in these games. Um, yeah, if it was a big inning, there was something controversial that went on, you're like, after this, I'm going right back and I'm going to send those photos off. And we're always yeah. worried about timing because uh, it's a 7 o'clock game. The 9, nine o'clock is usually the cutoff for uh, news sites, news media that, they're, that, are, mm -hmm. that are going for print, um, typically with Getty. Uh, our images are actually seen more by the away team. I love shooting for the home team. I, I root for all home teams here in Tampa, but the away team is where a lot of the stuff. And that's go. also where you you'll make your money, right? Exactly. Yep. So you exactly. got to be concerned about that. Yeah. So maybe walk us through the game. So uh, I'm gonna put up a, a shot here. So this was uh, this was last week. So like a week and a couple of days ago, um, this was a Rays game, a uh, Rays against the Minnesota Twins, and. This was just pregame, walking by. Uh, typically, we get a test shot that we send into the editor. That's so we send our images to an editor in New York, who double checks it and then clicks OK for the website. And so this was just one of my tests that I sent in because I thought it made a nice frame um, that can be used as some kind of a, a something that would be used to, to dis discuss Tampa or discuss the Rays going into um, the All Star break, which is next month, and. You know, obviously there's nobody on the field, and I just took advantage of taking a quick shot there. Um, but this was sent as a test, and the editor liked it, and he sent it off to the wire, which was awesome. And that kind of led into, yep. That led into the mascot that was walking by. I took another, I did a nice little photo shoot with him, because uh, that was fun. Just a fun picture that I sent in. You never know if it's going to get used. Uh, I sent it in as my second test shot, and it got picked up. Uh, I think I sent in a coach picture and a player picture as well, and those did not get picked up because they weren't just they weren't uh, standout images like these. And so then, just moving through the game itself, um, I start off the game and I photograph the pitchers, uh, starting starting pitchers in the first inning, and make sure we have these key shots that whoever wins and whoever loses articles are going to be about them. So yeah, because you got to, you're also shooting for telling the story, right? So, you know, a lot of these images are going to go along with stories. So, you know, you've got to shoot both sides, got to have those uh, mandatory shots is what I'll call them. Uh, I have to get those all the time when I'm shooting. When I'm shooting is that there's the mandatory shot that you need. I need this, you know, the, either the, the, the winning pitcher or the other winning pitcher. I need, you know, the the winning team celebrating, you know, the stuff like that. So, and that's yeah. this goes along with exactly what you just said. This was the winning pitcher. Um, he did a six inning shutout, mm -hmm. and I, this, I mean, this is a good shot of him just looking up. Usually, pitchers are walking back to the uh, dugout, mm -hmm. and their heads their are down. Heads are down. Yeah, they're not going to be looking up. Uh, maybe they're excited about the image, the the inning that they just pitched, 
or they're upset. But either way, this guy just he he just gave this feeling off like yep. he was stoked, and I was excited. I got the shot, you know, or striking out. So getting both sides of the uh, getting both sides of the coin here. And so a lot of the stuff you guys will notice that I sent in, um, it is heavier on the Minnesota side, and that's because Minnesota ended up winning the, uh, the game. And so on my, my, last, my last two edits, I focused a little more on Minnesota here um, throughout the game because I knew that that's, that's what was going to make the story. You know, this, this shot could, was used uh, in a Tampa Bay Rays um, blog talking about the pitcher. And this is one of those games that just didn't really matter uh, because it's, you know, national versus uh, American. But it's still it's still one of those things where, yeah, so if you just say, yeah, let's just go through your images kind of like so there's, you know, um, you're just telling the story about what, what's going on. Exactly. This uh, was making sure you tight on the action. And this was the this is the second part of a double play that ended the inning. Um, this is CJ Cron, the guy here on the left, number 24 of the, uh, of the Twins. He played for the, our team last year. And so yeah. I thought this told a great story of him pointing out to the outfield, to the guy that turned the double play. Um, and it, it spoke a lot for how they did for the game. So let me, let me ask you, so you got this. So the one thing, one thing about sports that I know is huge is uh, tagging your images. Uh, do you use photo mechanic? Yes and no. Um, and do so, you tag your images with photo mechanic or do you use something else? So I use an internal program through Getty. So um, you use Getty's program, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's because I wanted to be on the forefront of it. It's, it works way better now with uh, Max. It used to be, it used to be like the program for PCs and now they've updated it. So it works a lot smoother. Um, with Macintosh, so it reminds me very much of like a Photoshop and a Lightroom, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a photo mechanic and a Lightroom mixed together. Um, and it allows me to do all my keywording, all my tagging. Um, I have hotkeys set up. Uh, yeah, which... could you show anybody, like, could you show us, like, how, how do you, like, how do you go? Because one thing you have to do is, like, you usually have to tag every player that's in the shot, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you've got to, so how do you do that fast? Um, so I have a, a hotkey program called Typinator. Uh, there's multiples that are out there. You don't even need to have one. Uh, Photo Mechanic has one built in. But basically, the industry standard is called CodeReplacements.com. And mm -hmm. so what a code replacement is, is for Minnesota, I would type in MIN25, and it would automatically populate with the, this player's name, number 25 of the Minnesota Twins. That would all populate right then. Um, right. And that's kind of how I train myself. I know other shooters that have just trained themselves to do like a specific, just one letter and the number. And, you know, letter A will be the away team. Letter S will be the home team. Now, when are you captioning? Uh, once you do, so you've gone through, you've done your selects. Then you're going to send them off. Before you send them off, is that when you're captioning? Yeah. Or, yeah. Caption's so the last, last thing that step. I'm doing. Yep. So the caption's the last step. So after you, so you've gone through these images. These are your selects. So then now you would have captioned all these photos. So you would have had Gonzalez number nine, you know, is tagged in that photo. So that way, if anybody's searching, they can just search for that player, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I also tag, like in this image specifically, I would tag bat flip, yeah. uh, back, jersey. These little keywords that kind of, they really help when, when somebody's putting together some, something for a website that they want. Mm -hmm. They just want a player walking away with his backside flipping his bat. Oh yeah, no, de definitely. I mean, because that, that's a that's a big thing in the sports world is is uh, the speed in which it. But then also being able to to tag, and that goes for all journalism. You know, being able to keyword tag your images so people looking for the content can find it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, captioning is so important as well. Going mm -hmm. along with that, because yeah. some people will license the image, and for the first 24 hours that these images go online, they're actually free to license. Um, it's kind of like a communal pop for news. So people will just take a handful of images and immediately want to just put them up in like a uh, like a slideshow on their their website, news media website, and they won't even do anything with it. They'll just take my exact captions, and it'll be picture caption, and it's just like a slideshow of all the images. So it just kind of cuts the work for them. So I got, I got a couple questions for you then uh, along those lines. So Chris Wiley's asking uh, for your captioning. Are you taking notes yeah. while you're out there on the field shooting? 
That's a that's a good question. Uh, voice tagging is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So let, let's Nikon maybe it, maybe so. rewind it. So you're using Canon Nikon. I, I use Nikon. So you're I, using Nikon. Yeah. What are you shooting with with this? Uh, this is uh, either my D5 or my D850. I kind of switch back and, and then forth. Between so the then what you're doing is you're bringing up an image and then you're hitting the little voice recorder that allows you to tag something onto that image, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's that'll be. Uh, and that's I, in. I will tag that on the D5. Is it? Which which model? I mean, it's usually I know it's the top. You know, the top of line Canons and Nikon's have that. Is it in any other ones? It's not in the D850, and so yeah, the, I don't think so. My workaround with that is I'll actually I'll start a video record on my iPhone, and record the back of the picture or the the picture on the back of my camera, and just quickly say whatever happened, if I can't immediately take that memory card and put it in the um, the computer. Okay. Because it, it, it matters when, when this happens, you know, like a, 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 uh, when it should have been the third out that would have, well, when it could have been the third out that would have ended the, yep. the inning, but then it actually ended up starting the, the comeback tour of the game. Like that, that kind of stuff is the stuff that you want to caption correctly because that's news media that love that stuff. Got it. Um, so Jerry's asking, uh, Jerry's asking, how long was it before you got assignments for pro sports? That's a good question. How long was it? Yeah. Um, it's usually starting out like, like <laughs> Dave talks about, you know, you're starting out, you're shooting kind of, you know, local and you're working your way up to, you know, more of the college teams. Like when, how long did it take to get to sports or pro sports? Uh, Realistically, six years, six okay. years of shooting, but I wasn't just shooting sports. So like, we're going to talk about this in a so little bit you, about so love. So you're like, uh, like casually shooting sports for six years. So Correct. when you say that, how many times a year were you shooting sports? At the beginning, a lot. I don't know, maybe every other weekend. And then uh, toward the mid teens, 2000s, uh, maybe one sport event. A month, more one sport event every two but, months. But so there you go. So at least twelve times a year yeah. for six years, doing something at the amateur level to get to the point of pro level. Yeah. So I yeah. guess if you extrapolate that out, you know, you could get on the fast track if you did six times twelve times games locally. Absolutely. You know, that would be your thing. You know. Or you jump and, in on a high school. And right, you, right. you shoot away at a high school and then you jump away on a college and you photograph a ton of games at a college. All of a sudden, you're following a player because you've connected with that player. You've made these images with that player. When you, when you connect with mm -hmm, a player yeah. on a, a, a lower level like high school or college, it makes the world of a difference moving into the pro league because, you know, we as photographers... Well, they trust you too, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And they trust you. And as photographers, you don't really talk to athletes. Like, that's... That, there's kind of an invisible wall there because they are into their game. They are there to mm -hmm. do their job, and their job is to play that game. And our job is to document what they're doing. So to, to kind of break that wall, it allows for better pictures because it gives you better access to these players, but it's not something that you just walk up to and you're like, hey, how you doing? My name's Julio. I'm a sports photographer here. I want to talk to you and be your friend. So that's, that's not how it works. So, well, let me ask you this uh, about that. So you're talking about... Uh, taken you know six years to get to that point where you're shooting pro when you got to the the point though when you're shooting maybe something where you would need uh uh credentialing and for the people that don't know what credentialing is maybe we could explain that to them so what is first what is credentialing right that is your golden ticket right so credentialing is just you've got somebody who's saying they want you to go cover this event to cover it for somebody, you're on assignment, or you're, you're, you're basically a freelancer, but you're on assignment for somebody. It's like in your case, you're a freelancer, but you're on assignment. You're being credentialed through Getty, correct? Correct. Yeah, so they're saying, hey, we want Julio to go to the game, cover it for us, and we want those images, right? So you, you need the credentialing in order to get the access to shoot the games with professional gear too because a lot of stadiums will limit what you can bring in what you can't um it's also you're getting the vantage point like for example in there i imagine that shot you're in the you're next to the dugout down in the the pit basically yeah, this is you a know photo well and shot and that's where that that photo is in the pit and you're not going to get that from um 
from the stands. You're not going to get that from any of that. So that's why you need credentialing. So how, how did you first go about getting credentialing? Because I know a lot of people, that's the first step. They're like, well, okay, I've shot a bunch of games. I've done some high school. I've done some covering, like you talked about. How do you get credentialing? Um, just working hard and, and meeting more people in the industry. That's kind of where it's, that's, that's how I've gotten to where I've gotten is uh, worth that work ethic and who I've met. Uh, that's, that's helped me get to the, the level of, of mm -hmm. this, this, this top, this high end of, of Getty of mm -hmm. shooting pro sports. Yeah, to shoot pro, pro sports. So I would, I would add to that, I think, uh, is also just asking sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, definitely just asking. Uh, finding people who need the content and getting with them. You know, obviously with, with AP and Getty, that's, that's a harder thing. You know, but definitely at a local newspaper level or you get down to, you know, kind of a regional uh, publication, you know, that might be a place to start. But, well, you know, yeah. I think Dave had a uh, Dave Black had a, a recent class here oh, yeah. where he had a, a, a studio he went audience way into that. Yeah. yeah, asking questions, and that was one of his questions that he answered. Um, and I rewatched it like twice because I'm like, wow, that's funny how similar what Dave is explaining is kind of like the direction of my career has gone in. So, I think you guys should check that out because yeah, a pretty definitely. Good class. If you're if you're into you want to get really deep into that, and that's coming from like the master of it, right? I don't know how much you've learned from Dave Black, but I mean, <laughs> I've learned like. Like, like I said, I would not be a rocket photographer. Uh, and before that, I, I did shoot sports, but um, I would not be the, this good as I am if it wasn't for Dave. So definitely. Dave at heart is a teacher. Yeah. I mean, he's probably one of the best photographers yep. in the world. He is, I considered it. Uh, but he's, in his heart, he's a teacher, and he wants to see everyone around him grow. Uh, well, hey, we got to, oh, there's this course right there. But, hey, we got to take a break. When we come back... Uh, we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I want to get through them. And then it, uh, I also want to talk about in this next segment, there's an article that we both uh, read that we, I was interested to get our perspective, your perspective on it, and then just get our audience's perspective on it as well. So we'll be back in just a few minutes talking sports on assignment. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Canon. 
Make sure you don't miss any episodes of The Grid by subscribing to Apple's podcast app or iTunes. It's free, and we even have a special audio-only version, too. So sign up today. All right. Well, we're back. We're looking at uh, some more of Julio's images here. I wanted him to bring up for you guys uh, when he's talking about the, the metadata and tagging. Maybe, Julio, you could show them like what you're talking about. So you're in Photo Mechanic right now, right? Yeah, yes, you are. Super easy yes. way to look at pictures, Photo yeah. Mechanic. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even updated to the latest version. I'm still at Photo Mechanic 5. Yeah. Um, That's what I used back in the day. It's, so. it's perfect. Perfect for what we do for, use it for. Yes. So metadata and what we're doing when we're, we're editing these pictures mm -hmm. and, and uploading them is, you know, this is kind of what you're seeing here uh, where, you know, you see Garcia, number 24 of the Tampa Bay Rays, rounds third after hitting a homer off of Sabathia, number 52. So, like, I'm, I, I tag the, the baseball player that just hit the home run. I tag the pitcher that's also in the shot that is holding the ball in his hand uh, or holding the ball for the next play in his hand. And... This is all stuff that's just, it kind of has to roll quickly as I'm writing it through. Um, obviously, I already have certain things preset in there, like the date and the location, but a lot of the stuff is I'm just writing on the fly. Uh, and you can kind of see where, like, this other mm -hmm. stuff were keywords here, headline, description, uh, and writer, you have which your is crediting my, down there. Cre yeah, image yeah, rights and crediting yeah. here. And there's the stringer. And then just getting down, yep. <laughs> stringer. I love it. Freelancer and I love that. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. So that's really what it is. Just kind of looking at that. Um, you know, that's really the other side of uh, of sports, especially shooting for wire or even shooting editorial. You know, that that's the part that you, you know it's cool to shoot the images, but then you actually have to do all the work behind the scenes because that's one thing uh, when you when you go to the game. Uh, a lot of times for the bigger games you're not out of there right away. You're working after the game. You're still tagging. You're still going through your images. You're still uploading. So um, how early do you get to the games usually, and how late do you usually stay after the games? Un untypical. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, so my mentor has taught me time and time again that you need to get there as early as possible, and you leave when the job is done, whether that means you're, you're still culling, but you've already sent in your X amount of images for your first edit. Um, you're packing up your gear. You know, I like to set up remotes every so often, so I'm typically bringing my remotes back and looking at remote images as well. Uh, if I knew I got something good on a remote, I'd send it first edit. If not, usually that stuff goes second edit, uh, especially for baseball. But I'll get to a state. I'll get to the baseball stadium about two and a half to three hours before first pitch, and I'm typically walking. Uh, to the parking lot about an hour to an hour and a half after the game has ended. Yep. Yeah, and that's Which why no I mean traffic. that's what it is. It's a uh, it's a time consuming thing, and it, it it takes a lot of work. And it, then, like you said, like with any of this stuff, uh, I think the key getting there early, especially, is uh, it helps you to know the the players and know the game and see who's who's on their game right now in warm ups. Who's really going well? Who's who's favoring what sides? You know, uh, big thing with sports, and this goes for everything. Though I'm gonna say, is if you want to get better at sports photography, you have to know the sport better. Absolutely right, and it goes for everything because I can say that like rocket photography. The more I know about rockets, the more I know about the differences, the subtle differences, the better I get. The more you know about baseball and the interactions between the players and what player does this and what player does that and what their tells are like, cause you gotta think a lot of times we're looking through a lens where you, you're probably, well, what, what do you typically shoot at? Um, like a long lens, what's your long lens? 200 to 400 and so, I live at 400. So you're living at 400 and you're looking at the world through 400. We don't see a lot of times the pitcher, we have to look for flinches of their shoulder to see like, well, this one, he tilts his bat back before he really goes at the pitch. So you gotta look for those tells and you gotta, the more you know about the game and more you know about each player, the better your photography is gonna get, right? Well, to add to that, it's yeah. funny because you'll, you'll hear other cameras start firing off uh, before the pitch is even happening because they're just kind of hoping that their, um, mm, their yes. shutters, their, their, no. their, their high-speed no. shutter Don't will, do that. will capture it. Uh, and in, in real life, you may get one picture with a ball in the shot at anywhere from like three to 400 millimeter. Yeah. Uh, 
by luck. So that's at 11. I shoot, I think my D5 is 12 frames a second. Um, and that's one picture. If I'm just hammering it off, that's going to get the ball in the shot. Because that's why it's all about timing. It's it is about timing. And that's where it is. The more you can know about timing, too, it helps on the back end when you're not going through 3 million shots because you've been just spraying and praying the ball gets in there. So, yeah, very cool. Something uh, somewhere. Uh, so, hey, Michael's got a question here. Michael's asking, and this is a good one. Who owns the rights to the images that you don't send to the wire service? Technically, you do, but those can't go anywhere unless they go to the wire service. So that means I take a picture of this baseball game. The, my credential was with Getty Images. So that image, you know, if it's not a first edit, that image is going to be owned by me, but I can't license that image on my own. That has to go through an image licensing service because that's how my credential, uh, the little fine print on the back of the credentials, that's, that's kind of like what's in there and what you sign away when you and, sign. And, and that's that. where you say it varies. Your arrangement is such. There are people that have different arrangements. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something where uh, it matters on your arrangement. It matters on what, but most often that's what it is. Like you're saying, you, you still retain the copyright on the one, but it's kind of like, ah, oh, great, I can use it myself. And it's not it, like, so Major League Baseball, um, National Basketball yes, Association, you get into National those. Football League, yes. uh, they all have stipulations of me shooting there that I cannot sell those images for commercial without them knowing and without them approving and without Correct. them getting a cut of it. Yep. So that's kind of how that works, too. Yep. <laughs> All right, we got, some, we got some more questions. Let's see, we got, um, Tom's asking, if you're sending images via Wi-Fi, how do you caption? Does the editor caption for you? Uh, yeah, so if you're sending your images via one of the Wi-Fi transmitters, um, anything that you send in with a voice uh, annotation on there, that gets sent over at the same time. So they hear that or they'll just know that that play is happening because they usually have a monitor and, and next to their computer in the back room and they can see what's happening. They can kind of get an idea of, of what the caption's going to be. <coughs> or sometimes it's just a super basic caption like, you know, here's a shot of this player walking off of the field after the third inning. So that's usually um, in situations, like you said, though, where you've got like a high profile game, because most of the time, I know with my shooting as well as your shooting, when we're doing photojournalism, like we don't have assistants, we don't have editors, we don't, they're, they're off, they're in the editor land over there, and they're like, where are my images? Let's upload them. <laughs> um, but for the big games, you know, like, like for example, I've got a, um, a Falcon Heavy launch coming up, yeah. the Hub Falcon Heavy launch, I have an editor on site nice. who we're offloading images to. So that helps. But at the same time, most launches you don't have that because it's just more like, I just want my images. Where are they? So um, another question, Nina is asking, do you have a favorite sport to shoot? Wow, good, good question. Um, ah, that's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> put me on the spot. Uh, right now, I would say every sport's my favorite sport. I think my favorite is polo. I am uh, Interesting. outside of my, my Getty images and, and my, my freelance photography. I'm a club photographer for a local polo club, uh, which is actually like polo with horses and, and mallets, yes. like real old school polo. Uh, I think it's the oldest ball sport in the world. And that's yeah, stuff like is, here, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like this stuff. Uh, if you can see my computer, there's the Sarasota Polo Club. I don't know. Maybe you can see my computer. There it is. That's yeah, like that's a shot that you have there. And then you got Polo like here. Yeah. Very cool. It's something about the animal. I think that's, that's, the, that's the big difference on, mm -hmm. on the Polo stuff is just now we're not only do we have an athlete, we have a different type of athlete that's also involved that, uh -huh. that doesn't speak doesn't speak our language right but they have so much to do with the sport itself and they're they're beautiful i could say mine w is and will probably always be football i just love shooting football uh the only hard thing about football is it's a lot of up down and then you're getting on the knee, one knee getting up you know you're moving around it's uh it's a bear of a sport to, I think if you're actually, if you're doing it right, you're doing at least three to five miles per game. Oh, yeah. And maybe one. three to four, <laughs> maybe six. The thing is, I probably should be flights. shooting football because it would help me lose some weight. That's for sure. 
Anyways, uh, Sarah's asking, uh, any advice on getting hired by a wire service or getting a pass to shoot? So maybe just focus on getting hired for wire service because we went over the, the pass to shoot. That's more about you know getting the credentialing over time, but hired for a wire service. Um, being out there, finding a way to get a pass and letting yourself be seen by these other, these other wire services that are there. Uh, that's kind of how I've noticed these newer photographers coming in is that they've just been around and they kind of like, they came up from a different wire service and now they're with AP or the, now they're the new guy at Getty or now they're the new person at this USA Today. Um, that's kind of the, the, that's, I think that's the easiest way to get in with the wire service other than knowing somebody or just constantly hitting them up with um, your updated portfolio. You know, send 12 to 15 images to uh, Getty Images and, and just consistently sending emails to specific people that are editors in the area. And that's all stuff you'd have to kind of do some research to find out who's the editor for your area or who's looking at that kind of stuff to hire in newer contributors. So Art's asking, uh, that software you're talking about from Getty, can anyone get that? No, that is uh, internally for Getty um, employees and people that work. What's the best alternative to it? Uh, photo mechanic photo and Lightroom. Mechanic. It's uh, photo mechanic and Lightroom. You can't. Uh, I know people that just use one, but it's to be able to do things quickly. Uh, you want to be able to jump in and out of Lightroom or Photoshop to get your crops done, to get your color correction mm -hmm. done. Yeah, just, I mean, photo mechanic is really for viewing and and, and and picking your images. It's speed on that side of it. Yeah, massive speed because yes. it reads your. It makes a tiny little JPEG and it reads it so quickly. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, Chris is asking. Uh, what was the shot or the game that you got uh, that got you noticed to shoot for Getty? Was there a shot or a game or like you were talking about? I think it was just more of a you were consistently. It's just the hustle, just the consistent yeah. hustle of working in events and working on the the higher end of the. So commercial you wouldn't world. say it, it's one thing. No. It's it's a combination of putting in the work and doing it all the time and, and consistently doing work. I think that's a big thing, like you said, consistency. You can be a uh, like a one-shot wonder where it's like, oh, I got the one shot. But I think what agencies want to see, as wire services especially, but even agencies uh, that are looking for credentialing, they want consistency in the work. They want to see that, hey, this person, game after game, shoot after shoot, event after event, they're always hitting it out of the park. Uh, just. To go along to answer that and to answer uh, Rose uh, Karen's mm -hmm. question about how many, uh, I'm sorry, Nina, I noticed Nina. you don't have the ball. Nina's question, I noticed you don't have the ball showing in all of your shots. Is that an issue with getting your photos picked up by our wire service? So it's the consistency of the shot. No, I may not have a ball, a football, or the baseball in the shot, but telling the story the way I see it, which is in different eyes of somebody who's been playing baseball or shooting baseball yeah, for their like entire Yeah, like you lives. have ones with the, like, the, like that one, you got the ball in the shot. I mean, there's, there's tons. We probably just didn't get to a lot of them. But, yeah, I can't. You know, there's, there's a lot of them that have the ball in the shot. However, one of the things with shooting for wire as well is they're wanting, they want those in-between shots as well where – they're not going to be the sports portfolio shot. It's more just telling the story of that guy struck out, this guy won the game. Yeah. You know, it's, it's you're telling that story. So that's part of also shooting for wire services. You can't just go after the epic portfolio shots. You got to get the story of the game. And that's part of just, that is photojournalism where you're telling a story. Read, read newspapers and blogs and look yep. at the places that are going to pick up your pictures because that's what's going to tell you what these editors want to go towards. You know, they want to get the ball and the bat every single time. Then, and if you want to work on that shot, then get that shot every time. I personally don't because everyone else is getting that shot. So I'm looking at a different type of shot. But you're still getting the ball yeah. and the bat, and you're still getting that. Yep. All right, cool. Well, hey, we got to take a break. When we come back, uh, we, we got so many questions still coming in. So uh, we'll go over those questions. Hopefully, we can get to that article because I think it was cool. But I yes. think we might not have time. We'll see. And we'll see you guys back here in just a couple minutes. Image restoration has always been one of the most rewarding things you can do in Photoshop. Because it's not just, you know, like fixing a tear. It's more fixing a memory. And then you present it to either a family member or a client and they just look at it and, you know, their eyes fill with tears or whatever it is. It's just, of anything I've done in Photoshop, it's by far the most rewarding. In this course, you'll learn how to deal with many of the common problems like faded black and white photographs, faded color, 
tears, rips, unwanted elements like tape and writing. We'll even talk about how to deal with missing body parts. If you need to fix someone's face or replace a hand, you can just borrow it from another photograph. Back in the old days, many photographs were tiny like this. So the challenge is how on earth do you take something like this and turn it into an eight by 10 photograph? So we'll talk about how to calculate the correct resolution so it's easy to take a small photograph and make it big. It's definitely a skill that takes some time to learn and really get good at it. And once you do, then it becomes a skill you can share with other people and repair the photographs for other families and help them restore their memories as well. Generations to come will look at these photographs and go, wow, that was taken in 1902 and it looks pretty darn good. If you want to learn key techniques to bring life back into old photos, please join me for my new class on image restoration only on Kelby1.com. I found that there are common questions that come up in how to start a sports photography business. Not just how to take the pictures, but how to do the business of it in order to get published and uh, hopefully make a career out of it and be paid. And we'd bring an audience in and they would ask their questions. I will answer them and we will see if we can get to the bottom of how to make a living in sports photography. I think what the audience uh, will get out of this class is a better understanding of uh, sort of the progressions from shooting like youth to high school to college to the pros and then actually starting to use some lighting as well and move into the commercial sector of the industry. There's a repetitive pathway in all of this that I think will be very valuable to people in learning how to better uh, conduct their business or even start a business in sports photography. Come join me at my new class on kelby1.com. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Platypod, the world's most compact tripod base. Yeah, we just saw the Dave Black's uh, class there, that sports photography, uh, the business of sports photography class. And I'm telling you that if you want a fast track, the fastest track I could give you, because I, there is no magic like we talked about. There's no magic thing that's going to get you credentialing. There's no magic thing that's going to get you picked up. Uh, but his class would definitely shave off a lot of pain, right? Through the process. It, get, it gets you in the know. It yes. at least gives you the information so you're not going in completely blind yep. and like, what do I do? How do I get from this seat yep, to yep, down there? Yep, exactly. Hey, uh, let's rattle through some questions and then I wanna get to this uh, article that we were talking about. So uh, Tom's asking, if a media outlet wants you to, to use one of your images, how do you determine a price as a freelancer? Uh, so that that stuff is um, there are already there are programs out there. I think it's photobid.com that'll kind of give you licensing numbers. Photo quote, photo, photo quote, quote, photo quote dot com uh, will give you licensing numbers for whatever the, the usage is looking for. And that's again, you can't do that with a pro game. Um, sometimes at the collegiate level. Uh, you might be able to license an image out for a commercial purpose. And then especially like like even you're talking like your polo shots, I bet you probably could definitely license those, right? I don't think Absolutely. they have any no. restrictions. So that yeah. Is, that is all me with polo too. I own that stuff. I license it. I can right. do whatever I want. So that's sometimes like, yeah, the, the pro sports, why, uh, especially the pro big sports, why that's a pinnacle. There's a lot more restrictions on you oh, yeah. because not only do you have the restrictions from the agency or the, the the wire service, but then you have restrictions from the league. Yeah. So there's the league restrictions on top of that, which is why I mean everybody wants wants their money, you know. So it's not like free free lane with that stuff. My understanding is the days of three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year as a sports photographer are long gone. Oh, yes. um, I know guys that can do that that hustle. Yeah. But they hustle. They, they are nonstop shooting so, 300 days a year. Rose is asking, uh, how many photos do you take in a game? Uh, good question. Anywhere from, uh, so an NFL game, football game, I might do like 1,200 to 2,000 at most. I mm -hmm. try not to go over 2,000 uh, between two cameras. Um, if I'm running a remote, you know, that can be anywhere from an extra 1,000 to 4,000 images, depending on if the remote's actually firing. <laughs> Uh, Jerry, have you shot any auto racing? And if so, is the approach different? So first, have you shot any auto racing? I have not. Mm. I've shot cars uh, and done portraits of cars, but I have not I done could, Yeah, I can tell you I've shot like one. <laughs> and uh, it's very similar in the sense of, I mean, the techniques are similar. Absolutely. Panning techniques, you know, stuff like that. Slowing. It's amazing how 
uh, with with sports, especially with action, how it just it ver it's the techniques are the same. The only thing that varies is knowing that subject. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, if you understand like. We understand more. Like if I could, if you could go back and shoot it again, you'd be even better. And if you go back and shoot it again, you'd be even better. So it's just probably, I think the approach is the same. It's just putting in the time to master uh, knowing that sport. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Right? Yes, yes, definitely. Oh yeah, I, I do so many things different. Um, Jim, uh, is there a competitive a competitive spirit between the wire services on the sidelines, or do you just focus on the task at hand and block out the other photogs? All of the above. <laughs> so, um, there's definitely competitive spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You got, you know, Getty standing next to AP, standing next to USA Today. Uh, yep. Whose image is going to get picked up first for the New York Times? Because New York Times looks at all three of our wire services for pictures. So who's going to pick it up first or who's going to get the better shot? Um, and you kind of feel that amongst other photographers. But the, the majority of the community out there has become a lot more um, heartfelt and a lot more open to each other. Uh, <coughs> Because we're all in the same editing room, we're all lugging our stuff up the same stairs, up and down, and you know, those of us that are up way up top with the remote camera trying to get a wide-angle shot, there's usually more than one. So like that, that kind of community is there where we we look out for each other, but it's also a competitiveness, and you need to block it all out because you start thinking about, you know, if Bob is getting the shot next to you, you're gonna miss the shot because you're thinking about Bob versus yourself. Right. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, I think, yeah, I think we went through all the questions that are over there, but you have um, actually something that you were wanting to talk about. Um, you guys have a workshop, a sports photography workshop coming up, right? Yeah, so um, I work with a company called Summit Workshops, and it's a, it's a workshop company that's based off of Rich Clarkson, which is one of the greatest sports photographers ever. Uh, he shot 60, 6 0 Final Fours. Um, and so he created this workshop series back in the 80s to give back to students uh, at, um, at KU and at, uh, he was a photo editor at Sports Illustrated. He was also the photo editor at National Geographic. Um, and he started giving back with these various workshops and I kind of got brought in through uh, my mentor who's also an instructor. And so we have these, you know, specifically we have a sports workshop coming up next month in July in Denver, where it's six days of just all different sports that we specifically set up for our students. And um, you have instructors like Dave Black, you have other, you know, sports and like sports phenoms. So basically uh, if you're into sports photography and you're wanting to actually get out there. Now, they actually take you out and go shoot sports? Yeah, so we, yes. we set up specific sports, and then we also will go to games and events to shoot sports. Like, we'll go shoot right. a couple so this is like and... This is like also one of those things where it's like, maybe you can get some hands-on experience, you know? That's, that's so exactly definitely. right. And we, get, we have a sponsor, or you know, one of our sponsors is Nikon, where they provide big lenses and newer gear for students that can't afford a 400 or a 600 or they want to try the 800 uh, millimeter and they, they kind of loan that stuff out to us. So we kind of, we're, we're out there and we get out there to, to shoot these events and, and show what we can do. You know, at, in a baseball game, we'll set up like three or four remotes for the students to kind of see how we set them up and see all the images at the end. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool deal that we set up here with, with the, all of the different sports that we do. And the website that they can go to for that is? Photographyatthesummit.com. So photographyatthesummit.com. Well, hey, guys. Um, there was another topic we were going to get to, but I don't think we have time for that one. So uh, um, we will not go into it because I think, honestly, if I went into it, it would open up a big can of worms because I know we feel similarly about it. <laughs> And it probably would get pretty heated. All I'll tell people, too, though, from photographers is, um, you know, you really got to watch where your work is. I mean, one of the things that you know I thought was funny in this one article that we were going to is uh, they were actually talking about, and I want to go too deep into it, but they were talking about the exploitation of photographers and how photographers get exploited basic premise that you know because it's our passion because we love this stuff that a lot of times people will exploit people that have that passion yet the article at the same time had the lead image was from a royalty-free 
stock site that gives nothing back to photographers, not a single dime. And it's a site called Unsplash. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen Unsplash? Yeah, and that that can that can bite you back so hard because they don't even check um, model releases or location yes, property releases yes. for anything. And that I mean, Unsplash is becoming a huge thing. I've seen it in a lot of our. Uh, here at Kelby, a lot of our products that uh, you know you use and you license as a business will be, oh, free stock imagery through Unsplash. Basically, Unsplash is just coming the internet for people who have not right, rights managed their um, images and posting it on their sites. So they're going to places like Flickr, where if you don't tell Flickr that, hey, this is not Creative Commons, you can't use this, if, the, if you don't say my copyright, then hidden in Flickr's terms of use is that Flickr can let anybody use that. So Unsplash figured out a way to start using that. Yep. So that's definitely something I, I turned to. I remember searching for some of the, you know, some of the site, and I found some of the shots from some of my uh, rocket photography guys. Wow. And uh, I said to them, hey, you know, anybody can go get your images for use for free. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? And I showed them, and they're like, Oh my gosh, I got to go change that. So that's the thing is, you know, you've got these sites that are popping up now that are taking advantage of those loose terms that sites like Flickr, um, even social media platforms they have that you kind of have to watch. So it's definitely something to watch for. Um, well, we uh, had uh, at Photoshop World, we had uh, the new the copyright lawyer from. Yep, um, yep. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember, but yeah, Photoshop World, we had uh, something about uh, the copyright and all that stuff. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a big topic. I mean, it's just something to watch out for. I just thought it was funny in this article that they're talking about exploitation of photographers and then leading with an image that is from a site that's exploiting photographers. <laughs> so it was anyways. All right. Speaking of Photoshop World, though, I, uh, I, if you want to go, are you going to be a, you're going to be a Photoshop world? Always. Yes. <laughs> you're going to be a Photoshop world. I'm going to be a Photoshop world. You should be a Photoshop world. It's coming up August 21st to 23rd. There is a big, big announcement this week. I cannot spoil it, but I can tell you this, that if you check your email, there is a big announcement. Somebody has been added to Photoshop world that is going to be huge. And I cannot spoil it because I don't want to spoil it for all the people that are going to get the email and go, oh, I got to go. <laughs> but anyways, um, look for that this week. Uh, we've got a new, uh, new instructor coming on and a new uh, session coming on. So definitely check that out. So, yeah, Leibowitz was the name of the Richard, law firm. Richard Leibowitz. Yeah. That's the copyright lawyer that we yeah. had at Photoshop World. Yeah. He'll be back in Vegas again. Yeah. Great presentation. Yeah, especially if you're into that. Yeah, if you're into, you know, wanting to know about copyright laws and stuff about it affects you as a professional, uh, something you got to check out. So, but hey, guys, uh, we have run out of time. Uh, we've gone over time. Uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be back next week. Next week, Scott is back. He's actually, he's back in the country. If they, well, let's just say if they let him back in, who knows, back in. but, um, he'll be back. <laughs> and, uh, our guest next week is Christy Shirk. So nice. shark, the shark will be here. So pixelator. Well, uh, Julio, thanks uh, for stopping by and talking about that stuff. Where can Thank they go you. check out your stuff? Is that your probably your Instagram? Yeah, or? Instagram, Julio A. Aguilar at Instagram. I'm terrible at social. Um, you can also just go to Getty and type in Julio Aguilar, and you'll see you my photo stream there. So, yeah, follow him on there on the Insta. All right, guys. Well, we will see you guys next week on the grid. Well, I, I, I won't see you. I'm going to be on vacation, but Scott will be here with Christina. All right. So All right. See you guys.